hearts to the Lord together. Precious Heavenly Father, as we call upon your holy name today, we are grateful for the love that you have shown to each and every one of us. We know that we can never be worthy of the love that was shown for us in your coming to earth as a baby, but we're grateful that you cared about each and every one of our needs. There's no burden too small but what you are interested, nor any problem too great but what you are able. We would just ask this morning that you would fill us with hope, fill us with love, fill us with peace to walk in your will. Just guide, protect, and direct throughout this service. May we just draw closer to you and walk daily in the light of your will. Your blessed holy name we do ask it. Thank you. You may be seated. Greg, if you'll come and share with us at this time. By the way, you're not limited to one song. Take as much time as you need. <laughs> sharing with us this morning. From God's Word this morning, we'll be looking at Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 26. Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, 
Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy and will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Precious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wonderful gift of your love. We pray that you will help us this day to walk faithfully in the light of what your word says to us. Your blessed holy name we do ask it. Amen. You know, at Christmas time, it's always fun to watch little kids who they really seem to be able to embrace, embrace this verse. You know, they seem to think that nothing will be impossible, that Santa Claus will just bring them whatever it is they want. I still remember a real touching story one year on Christmas Day. I was watching the news, and uh, unbeknownst to her mother, a little girl dialed 911 about 10 o'clock Christmas morning that Santa Claus hadn't shown up at her house, and she wanted to report if, uh, you know, something had happened to Santa. Well, uh, let's just say before noon, a fire truck arrived with Santa Claus and her presence. So, you know, so she was, uh, but all that aside, we know that's a different thing. But you know, sometimes as we grow up, we lose sight of the impossible. And we tend to make more things impossible in our eyes. Let me tell you, if anyone thought something was impossible, it was the message that the angel gave to Mary. But verse 37 clearly says, nothing shall be impossible with God. Can we embrace that in our hearts once again? Nothing shall be impossible with God. We certainly live in a day that's filled with gloom and dissension in the world all around us. But we need to embrace afresh and anew. Nothing shall be impossible with God. I think one of the favorite themes that was often put on Christmas cards for years um, was peace on earth. Well, we all know that peace in an earthly kingdom uh, is few and far between. I was thinking as I was working on this message this week, just about all of our country's closest allies in the world today, we've been at war with at some point in history. <laughs> Think about that. And so, you know, it's just a matter of peace among men is a rare thing. But the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary with a message that seemed utterly impossible to her. And yet, one statement sums it all up. Nothing shall be impossible with God. We can't imagine what must have been going through Mary's mind as she was going about her business. Most scholars believe that Mary was probably not more than 14 or 15 years old when she received this visitation from the angel. It was a different time and culture, okay? But yeah, anyway, when she received this vision. She was little more than a young girl. And she was told, Hail you who are favored. And, you know, I'm sure the first thing in her mind was, What? <laughs> Me? Favored? But 
Then the angel Gabriel proceeded to tell her all the details of what was going to take place, not just in her life, but what her child's role would be in the whole world. And she just, you know, it was an overwhelming statement to hear. And yet, it was summed up, nothing shall be impossible. The greatest sign to confirm what she was saying, she had a cousin Elizabeth, much older than her, old enough that it, no one thought she would ever have any children, and now she was six months along towards bringing John the Baptist into the world. And that was to serve also as a sign to Mary that what the angel said was going to happen. But what she was promised in this passage was the character of the child and what his birth would be like. He would be called the Son of the Most High. He would receive the throne of David and his, he would fulfill all the promises and characteristics of what we read in Isaiah chapter 9 at the beginning of the service. Of his kingdom there would be no end. Of his peace, it would reign forever. I, do we really embrace the promise of what Christ's coming means in our lives today? I think so many times we have lost sight of what is impossible. You know, I, I like to hear some people say, no, I don't lack faith, I just like to be practical. Well, you know what? Yeah, there is some reason to be practical. And by the way, I, I will not hesitate to say, you know, when someone says you express your faith by, you know, picking up a copperhead or something, no, 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 that, that's, that's testing God's faith. But when God has promised something, do we really believe that it's going to happen? Or have we become so numbed by all the turmoil and everything that goes on around us? Hey, we know. All you have to do is turn on the news. All you have to do is listen to people walking down the street. And you know that sin permeates the world around us. But just because there is sin around us does not change the fact that nothing will be impossible with God. And are we tapped into the impossible, or are we tapped into the practical of everything that's going on around us? He wants us to once again embrace what seems impossible. We really need to restore our confidence in the power of God, that just as Jesus came on that first Christmas morning, he came to a world that, you know, really wasn't ready to receive him. He came in a fashion that, you know, uh, normally if a king is to be born, there's great pomp and circumstance and the greatest of goods are laid out. Well, he came and he was born in a barn behind the, you know, behind the inn. Not much of the greatness, but let me tell you the promise of that morning. The message of the angels, peace on earth, goodwill towards men, didn't end on that first Christmas morning. That transfers to all of the reign. It said his reign would be forever. Oh, we know that Jesus' ultimate reign here on earth is still coming in the future. But we have to believe in the possibilities of his Kingdom. I, I was just reminded of a story again this week. I remember a few years ago, one of our uh, missionaries, he was actually director of all of our fields in Africa, and one of our dignitaries from Kansas City, our church headquarters, was had gone to Africa. Well, of course, the missionary who was there in Africa, he had all the visas, and he could travel freely from country to country, but this uh, gentleman from Kansas City, I think it was one of our generals, but that's not what's important to the story, okay? It was, uh, he wanted to take this leader into one of the other countries, and the leader didn't have the right paperwork. 
So obviously they weren't going to try to sneak in or anything like that. He went to the customs agent and said, uh, you know, what would we have to do to be able to get him to cross the border to see this church? And the customs agent said, it would take a miracle of God to get him across the border. And the missionary responded, that I can handle. <laughs> and he went to prayer, and together, within a half hour, they legally walked across the border and went to the country. Why? Because God deals in what is impossible. Let us not forget that the message of peace on earth still is for us today. Oh, I know. There is a lot of distrust. There is a lot of, you know, uncertainties going on all around us. Um, Do you ever see a time when nobody trusts anyone any more than today? And a lot of that is, we, we've entered a time where some people feel it's okay to lie if you don't get caught at it. Um, I, I love it. I, I'll admit I like to watch Judge Judy, okay? You know, she's, she's funny, but let me tell you, I, I love it when she's questioning someone and she'll look at them and say, I don't believe that. And I'll say, oh, okay. And then change another story. So you know they were just trying to, well, let me tell you, we live in a world where people don't trust one another. And it's hard to build peace. But let me tell you, Jesus, the kingdom that he promises, is one of peace. He wants us to first be at peace with him. Yes, first and foremost, we need to know that our sins have been forgiven. Not something that we want to do. Not a balance that if I do more good things than bad things, I'll be okay. No. We have to know that Jesus forgives us. And he's right there to do it. He wants us to be agents of peace. He wants us to first be at peace with him. You know, it's hard for us to spread peace if we don't have peace within ourselves. And if we don't know Jesus, we don't have that peace. But he wants us to be at peace with him. He wants us to share peace with the world around us. It is so easy to look at what's wrong and think there's nothing we can do. I would like to be reminded of how many times when I see someone, the first thought is in our mind is, can I really witness to this person? Will it make a difference if I witness to this person? Well, let me tell you, we won't know if we don't try. We are supposed to be agents of peace, spreading it around the world. I, I hate to say this, folks, but I almost believe the church has lost sight of the fact that we have a God who deals in the impossible. We have a God who is greater than all of the circumstances that we deal with. We have a God who is interested in every phase of our life. And sometimes I fear even the church has lost that vision. That we feel like the church has become a small light in a world of darkness. Listen, we need to be empowered by his love, to share that light, to share the peace on earth, to share the good will towards men with all that we come in contact with. We have to start right here at home. You know what? If we're really messed up and discouraged ourselves, we're not very effective in sharing it. Uh, can you imagine going to a car dealer that sold, you can pick whatever brand you want, but if you went to a car dealer that was trying to sell you a new Ford and he told you all the advantages of owning a Chevy, uh, probably not going to sell it. By the same token, if he told you everything that was wrong with the product he was selling, you're not going to be interested. 
And yet, how many times do we in the church reflect depression, discouragement, instead of the power of Jesus at work in our hearts? Nothing shall be impossible. When I think of Mary, oh, she didn't understand everything that was going on in her life. She couldn't. But I'd like to share one more thought. It says Mary was favored. What did it mean that Mary was favored? I was reading an article by Dr. Caroline Lewis, and one of the things that she suggested, why Mary was favored. God knew she would be completely obedient and completely trusting. In other words, the example of what a disciple is supposed to be. How do we find God's favor? By trusting in Him and being obedient. Did you ever see someone, you know, you're trying to, um, maybe you're trying to lead uh, a little child and there's something you want to, you know, you need to step over and the parent knows it's safe or you wouldn't take them, but yet, the child hesitates and resists because they don't want to step across. Well, then after a while, they have this complete trust that they'll run anywhere because they're sure mom and dad are going to catch them. Listen, we need to have that trust that Jesus will not lead us somewhere that is not right. Or do we have our confidence in Him? I know that we do live in a day of challenges. No one's denying that. But just as Jesus came with peace on earth, goodwill towards men, His kingdom does not end. He still has a message of peace on earth, goodwill towards men. Will we be faithful disciples and obediently sharing what he has done for us. Can we be part of the light and not part of the darkness? Let's let our light shine for him and let's let the joy and peace of this Christmas season shine forth in all the world around us. I want us to stand and sing in closing once again that song we've been singing throughout the Advent season. Joyful, joyful, we adore you.